What? Are you running from back of the back podcast you just heard Aikiaka the track Endless Battle it's a new band members from Florida as well as Hawaii they will be playing the Hammer and Nail Festival next month as their first show memorializing and giving support to the family of Josh Couture guitarist recently of Exit Strategy um, BJJ Black Belt and longtime veteran of the Florida hardcore scene had passed and our guest, Gavin, longtime friend of Josh's. Josh had been uh, slated to be in the band Aikiaka, but it didn't come to pass. And our friend Gavin, who does Still Proud Clothing and now lives back in Lahaina in Hawaii, is uh, going to be our guest tonight. We're going to have a great conversation. Uh, before that, I apologize. It's been two months since this is hardcore. And now the longest period of time that I've not done a podcast. Life gets in the way. It's the best thing I can say about it. And we're back on track. Thanks to Jess for doing those Insta- uh, Instagram lives to try to give us some um, contact with the listeners. Uh, I, I do apologize. we going to be working towards what we were talking about previously about getting um, episodes on the video. Uh, you can still go to the YouTube channel. Anything that we have recorded just comes out, but we don't have like the actual moving videos. But you can still listen to it as well on YouTube. And um, we'll have links. Everything's on TIHCpodcast.com. And just once again, sorry for the time off. Somewhat more needed for me. A lot of people reach out. In fact, Gavin is like, yo, I need a new episode. And I'm like, why don't you just get your ass on the show? That was the impetus to start really rolling the ball. Um, another thing that really needs to be said is to uh, say that someone who I was so hopeful and actually spoke many times about it, um, Big Frank from California had passed. And it, it was another jolt to be like, yo, you got to stop talking about it. Got to start getting about it. And there's a bunch of these projects that we're going to be ripping and rolling with. And so I'm going to be doing a lot more of these and talking into this stupid mic and hoping people listen for a lot more fucking hours because there's a lot we got to do and we don't always have the time we think we do with the people that mean a lot. So Big Frank, I could go on forever. Um, Go to episode 81 by 185 miles south. He's... Not just in one capacity, a legend, but his story is absolutely fucking amazing. And I really will always regret not constantly pushing harder to try to sync it up. Me and him were back and forth for over two years trying to make it happen. And it's it's a shame. And But more importantly, not just for the podcast, but for the world of hardcore. There's so many amazing things, the small things, the little things. That Big Frank did for so many people who would become giants within hardcore and did so many things. And this giant man with an insanely big heart 
did so much incidentally just because he loved hardcore and its impact when so many people for almost 40 years was prevalent when so many people you know gave their to um Instagram story about when they met Frank or what record Frank told them to buy or records that he put out for bands it's incredible his story is awesome and it's about the best I could say uh big shout outs also to uh OG Jeff Gavin from Broad Street Breakdown has been pushing me along as I've been painting more and he and Vinny and P are really doing well bringing Broad Street Breakdown back every week Make sure you're checking out that podcast. And since when this comes out, it'll be Friday. Big shout out to Bob for going above and beyond what most people would put up with. And instead of just throwing in a towel because a bunch of brats on the internet were complaining, he went ahead and moved his entire festival and pushed things back a bit and... Like in typical Bob Wilson fashion, absolutely fucking smashed in an amazing lineup. Now it'll be taking place in Orlando, and I really look forward to seeing all of you who didn't act like a complete bitch um, in January in Orlando. And just for the record, for people who were complaining the entire time since October 7th, the previous year, the JCC that had been home from FYA from 2020 to 2023 had been donating to Palestine every month. And yet you still went ahead and demanded a DIY promoter take their vent somewhere else to placate your idea of fairness in this world. The irony is that you went to Slipknot, you went to Knock Loose, you went to Corn, you went to all these big places and you put money in the hands of people like Live Nation. And these people give directly to the same thing that you're protesting. And not to hide my own dirt, because I'm not a bitch. I'll say it pretty simply. When we get to the point in Philadelphia, it's only going to be Live Nation or AAG Live left. There's no venue currently in Philadelphia that is completely privately owned for This Is Hardcore to use. The fact that we are still working at Franklin Music Hall is directly related not to the corporate entity, but to my actual friends, the people that I came up with, and the people that have supported this as hardcore, who are just like you and I. We get up, they get up in the morning, they got kids to raise, people to feed, houses to have over, or roofs over their heads, and their houses to keep. So they work for a concert agency that doesn't do the best things. But it's the way the world works. The bigger picture musically is the biggest players are always going to donate to bullshit that is almost completely against the grain of anything punk rock is a part of. But if you want to see Green Day and Rancid and Corn and unfortunately now the Knock Looses and all these bands that are growing from our scene to become part of the bigger music network, you're going to spend money that is going to end up going into the wrong hands because these corporations are fucking disgusting. And disgusting enough that they created monopolies and they buy out entire industries. And where once Philadelphia had a major open competitive market, there's basically two two names in the game and it's the same two names in the game everywhere. They might have different companies sometimes in smaller cities acting but it's still the same two companies so if you don't want to come to this is hardcore because AEG owns um electric uh fractal music hall that's on you but electric factory was where this is hardcore was able to grow from 2012 to 2024 the relationships that i have with the people in the venue are the only thing that really keep me in that venue because they're absolutely the salt of the earth and they go above and beyond and they push against the corporate stuff to try to make stuff like this is hardcore happen alongside all the things that are naturally going to come to a large venue like that. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people who, once they get into a comfortable situation, wouldn't push back for their friends 
wouldn't help the punk rock people get into places that we probably aren't supposed to be. But that's the kind of folks these people are. And that's why I'm still involved with Franklin Music Hall. And I have no control of what the parent company who owns the Franklin Music Hall does with their fucking money. So I'll just put all this shit out on the table. And once again, God bless Bob for having the balls to say, hey, you know what, I'll push this back a little bit and I'll give the people what they want and I'll acquiesce to their um, wants. And I personally believe that most of the people complaining on the internet were never going to buy a ticket to FYA in the first place. I'll just let it be right here. So now that we're past that part, I'm glad to be back. I'm sorry it took so long. And we got some shows. In fact, in the next two weeks, we got shows. Uh, we 1010 Terror at the First Unitarian Church. Harley's back with Cro Mags. It's going to be fucking absolutely crazy just because of that factor between the old guys and the new guys. I can't fucking wait. Um, my young brother, Austin, and his uh, band, Haywire, who is ascending to the fucking moon at this point. Absolutely one of the best sets of This Is Hardcore. Incredible set at, at Club Reverb. Haywire will be playing. Hold My Own will be playing. My brother, Greg Falchetto. And the one and only Kev Hare, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania's favorite son of hardcore, and his band, Fall Salvation, featuring none other than the indestructible Marty Williams and many other gunners. That's going to be next Thursday. So... Got more stuff. Check it out at phillyhcshows.com. Bob does a lot of shows. Even that Drayden does some shows. Ben Stuckey is stepping at the fuck up. He's got some dope shit. I don't have my notes in front of me. I'm winging it right now just to get this one out of here. There's been a little bit of anxiety about the time. And I think some of you guys can understand when you stop doing something for a while, then you pick it back up. It's going to be a little bit hard to, uh, you kind of like, uh, uh, uh. And then with it being the end of the summer, a lot of people were away. Didn't link up things the way I wanted. Got really busy doing work and then work after work. So here we are. We're back. Episode 166. Uh, eight weeks or ten weeks, whatever the fuck it was, since the last one. My apologies. I'll do better. I chose to have Gavin on the show um, just by nature of a couple of things. He said, sent me the songs for Akiaka. Absolutely incredible. Very... Very nuanced um, kind of thing where if you're a big fan of the late 90s, 2000s, um, Eulogy, Florida, Metallic, Hardcore, that's the first thing that came to mind when I heard this. But uh, before that, he was really kind and sent me some free clothing from his company called Still Proud. I say it on the podcast, I'll say here. Absolutely. For someone from Hawaii and Florida, dude made one of the thickest hoodies I've ever owned. Great quality. And I kind of like that stuff. There's a lot of people out here making hardcore or just clothing companies on the cheapest shit. And the shirts look cool. The hoodie was cool. And then um, always giving love and support to the podcast. And with Josh's passing and the upcoming fest, it seemed cool to not focus on a band that had been out for a while, but bring to light a new band and a person who's been a part of hardcore. And, and even when he was literally thousands of miles away from the mainland. And it's just, it's got a cool story. And I wanted to just change the pace to bring it back up. So let's fucking go. So today's episode is going to be absolutely fucking for me. I, I, I know there has been Hawaiian hardcore, but I've never actually been able to sit down, break bread and talk about Hawaiian hardcore before. And so uh, my man, Gavin, who, uh, was very kind when I completely fucked up <laughs> trying to uh, <laughs> pop for the Hawaiian boys and uh, just said, hey, hey, you know, we ended up talking and he wanted to come up on the podcast. I've been wanting to talk to you specifically through all the stuff that you were going through before, mm-hmm. your your um, your kind gift to me, and then to the top of it, now you have this band. I, I think mm-hmm. we got a lot to talk about, man. Absolutely. Totally agree. <laughs> so how, how does your, how does everything start? I mean, like, we got to, I, I, it's, it's got to start with childhood. I need to know like what, what it's like growing up. And then like, how did you end up even finding hardcore out there? So what is what we're originally going to get to? Okay. So here's the thing. So I was born and raised in La Um, till I was eight. 
when okay. I was eight, uh, mom, dad, guys got a divorce. Um, that's when I went over to Florida. Okay. So I was in, yeah. So I was, in, I was in Florida for eight till like probably mid twenties. Uh, so a long time. Um, and that's where I discovered, you know, got into my, what part business. of, what part of Florida were you in? Uh, it was in, uh, Cape Coral, Fort Myers near Naples. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And then, uh, Tampa is the last where I left off, uh, for the last five years of that um, time span. Awesome. So what, what, where did, like, what did your parents do? How did you start linking up and what kind of music were they into? How did they get you into music? Yeah. So, I mean, musically, yeah, the, out in Florida, that's kind of where it came into fruition. Um, Super musical household, not necessarily practitioners, just, you know, fans. My mom, we used to call her Mosh and Mom, super into classic rock and stuff. That's and awesome. When I, yeah. When I started to get into, like, you know, Nirvana and all that shit, Metallica, that's when she, you know, like, would take me to, like, every fucking concert. So I've seen everybody, like, all the... Uh, South Florida used to have, like, 96 K-Rock Fest, uh, 99X Fest. So I've seen, like, ZZ Top, George Thorogood onwards and upwards to she took me to Lollapalooza I think it was 97 or 98 and this is when Rage Against the Machine had Evil Empire Metallica was on load Rancid was on an outcome the wolves and like Soundgarden the third album so um you know she she saw that I was super into music and you know took me to everything I mean I've been to Ozfest you know the early days how old were you how old were you for that Lollapalooza uh I probably was about 13 that's awesome. Yeah, we it's saw wild. one of the we saw one of the really early ones and I was about the same age, like just just at a, just between the end of grade school, the beginning of high school, man. And uh -huh. I grew up with a lot of classic rock and got to see a lot of them same bands. So it, right. it, it everything you're saying just hit. It's like, yep, George Thorogood, Delaware yep. Destroyers, like all that shit. Yep, cheap trick, all the whole thing. Yeah. Um and yeah, like what's crazy about that little flu is like she would always like she, she had to be the groupie mom. She would always like show up with fucking t-shirts, just signed from every band on the roster and shit. And like after a lot, like we went on Soundgarden's bus right after that little Palooza. And then in the morning and shit, like you know, my brother and her went out to go get breakfast in the hotel lobby. So I I, I walk out, I see my brother strumming Tim Armstrong for Rancid's acoustic guitar. Oh and, shit! And fucking in walks Zach De La Rocha. And like <laughs> 13 year old me just like shit a brick, dude. Cause you know, like that band, like Rage Against the Machine is one of the bands that like changed my perspective on music. It showed me, hey, heavy music can be, it can have a message. It can be political, you know? So like seeing that, like, you know, icon like that, you know, totally blew my mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, she would, she went to, there's two shows that I was pissed off that she didn't take me to. One was Typo Negative, which of Damn. course, she had a fucking t-shirt signed by Peter Steele. Of course she did. <laughs> exactly, right? Like, come on, mom. You took me to everything but that one. And then like Pearl Jam on one of their, you know, big arena album tours and shit. But yeah. So she was super supportive in music. And that's kind of, you know, kind of gave me the pass, you know, in my younger years to start bands and in, you know. What was your earliest, what was your earliest band? Yes. Yeah, so it was a new metal band. So that, that was kind of my, you know, from the, the Metallica and whatnot, getting yeah. into heavier shit. Yeah, new Metal was kind of that outlet and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, that was the first band I started. And then the funny thing is, like, once I started, mis once I discovered, like, Hate Breed, you know, Satisfaction yeah. is a desire, or, like, Poison the Well, because in Florida, you know, Poison the Well's from Florida. Like, hearing Opposite of December changed my music, you know, that and Hate Breed changed my perspective. So I was like... I slowly started to convert the new metal band into kind of like a metalcore band. A lot um, of bands did that at the time too. Yes. I should like, there was a ton of bands right after the corn self-title drop. And I remember because the suburbs and all the bar bands, they all yep. like went from being like hair, hair long to short hair, then the right. weird beards. And then they all started wearing the, um, the Adidas pants. <laughs> and then as it got heavier and it got different, it was like, all right, new metal gone. Now we're gonna go into metalcore. <laughs> right, exactly. That's uh, that seems to be the common trajectory of most. <laughs> yeah. Most people. Uh, but yeah, then the the metalcore years. Yeah, once that band ended, then it was more of a hardcore band called. Uh, did Pulled you? Did you start in like not just playing the music, but did you start like playing in the more of the scene kind of shows? Like, how, like where what like where were you playing yeah. at that second band? <clears throat> so, 
in at that time i mean yeah there was a couple metal you know metal bands which yeah. new metal stuff um and there was some hardcore bands before i knew what hardcore was like there was this band called jayuna from south florida super diy like political activism type shit yeah uh, they would throw shows at uh the fort Myers skate park so okay i guess my first hardcore show without knowing that it's hardcore was seeing grade seeing uh reach the sky and i was you know blown away but still i, I had no context for it and you know didn't know the wealth of bands you know within you know that time period and thereafter uh, but I had a friend in high school um, uh, named Colby. He's probably out there somewhere. Um, he would always, he'd be like, you know, show up to first first period class and he'd be like, oh man, I'm so tired. I just went and saw a 10 yard fight. And I'm like, cool. All right. You know, like I yeah. didn't, had no context for all this shit. Um, and the scene at that time. So like I got into, once I started playing in bands, I started booking shows too. Um, awesome. I partnered up with a friend Vince. He used to have this show on uh, on the radio, super late night. It was like a you know late night metal and hardcore um, show. Um, I partnered up with him, to, and we started Always Prevail Productions to book shows through South Florida because you had you know there was Cape Coral, Fort Myers, Naples. There was all these little pockets of scenes, but nobody came together. So we found the venue. It was a church, First United yeah. Methodist Church, of course, because church is always taking you know everybody. Um, so that gave us like a central base to book stuff. And we we booked, you know, everywhere, anybody from like 25 to life. Uh, we booked a couple of PA bands, uh, Kingdom, I think Kingdom and Barricade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they made that tour. It's exactly that tour. We booked them. We booked CDC on a fest, Bishop, you know, uh, Thick as Blood, all those all those guys. Um, so, yeah, we we tried to converse it all. And so finally that scene was, you know, united for, for those years that we were doing it. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's the classic example of, Hey, if you've got an idea and you want to see a scene in your area, you got to fucking build that shit, man. Cause nobody's going to do it for you. As no, you're it, <laughs> yeah, what was so cool about it is it's like water finds a way, right? Like exactly. if you're apt to do something, you're going to, you're going to push yourself. And I mean, I, I love that you started at a church cause so much, so much awesome shit happens when you're able to have a lot of, uh, control you know like if you just started booking out of a club you've got people over you trying to take your money you're not understanding those little weird details that come from just putting on a show having to remember to make a checklist that bring markers that bring duct tape yeah. you know these all these weird little things that if you just did it out of a club you'd never have to carry in your bag now right. on top of it at that time a lot of these bands like you just mentioned even 25 they were still completely self-booked mm -hmm. so there were yeah. bands that weren't on the radar unless Today is even worse. Like it's so much harder for a DIY band to kind of get in the mix with all the other names of the bands that have, whether it's the paid promotion, the, all this extra stuff. So you you did it at a at a good time to learn, but also you did it at a time when a lot of bands coming through needed someone like you to oh, do the sure. shows. You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was crazy. Like um, <clears throat> this guy, we partnered up with this dude Matt Youngblood, the most like kind, down to earth dude that we were able to throw shows at his venue for or at the church and he would he'd be like he down for anything you know just just to get people in the doors and he wasn't like the preachy type where you know it's we're not gonna turn this into a mass it's just hey let's just bring let's bring this underground subculture into the church and see what happens like my bands would practice upstairs you know in his in one of their side rooms and whatnot and they're just super welcoming individual um that without you know it would have been extremely hard to do what we did you know during that time was he a pastor or is he just like someone who had like worked activities in the church yeah he was the pastor did you guys ever know about the ocala scene at the time that was up more way more north than you guys yes i pl so um, punishment punishment and ringworm did it in 03 that was like one of the first times we played up yep. that way and the same similar scenario church very welcoming community hardcore kids booking it but like a church pastor kind of overseeing it almost yeah. We didn't play there. Um, I can't remember. It was kind of like a warehouse. There was a, one of the bands was called the Fighting Grounds. Um, I don't know, but yeah, yeah, definitely. I made a couple of trips up to Ocala during that time. Um, but yeah, yeah, Florida's wild, man. There's so many different fucking pockets. You know, you got your hard fucking ghetto ass, you know, scene down in Miami and whatnot. 
and then you know yeah all the way up to jacksonville and everywhere in between is is you know unique little pockets of scenes and, and whatnot so yeah it was wild those days were wild so where did you go from there did you did you start just doing more bands did you start traveling yep so <clears throat> Um, I played in bands for about eight, nine years. Um, that's all I wanted to do. Like, I just wanted to be in a touring hardcore band. Never got to do that. But then, you know, at the same time, I was finishing up college. So What were you in school for? Uh, Florida. I went to Florida Gulf Coast uh, University. I got my BA in um, communications. So like public relations and a minor in advertising. Um, so once that happened, you know, that's when the band life, you know, ended. You know, everybody had responsibilities within the band. And, you know, I was just a young man, you know, trying to find my own way um, at that point. So that's, yeah, that's when the music ended. And then that's when I was like sitting in my uh, cubicle one day and I'm like, fuck, man, what do I do? Like, I'm used to vocalizing all of my frustrations, getting everything out with a mic. How do I turn that? To, how do I take that and turn it into art? How do I express that and get it out? And then that's when Still Proud started. I was like, oh shit, a t-shirt. It does not get any more yeah. other than that to, to say what you gotta say than that. So then that's when I started Still Proud. So that's what kind of took over and filled the void, you know, from my formative years, you know, screaming in a mic. Um, yeah, so that's what I did for a long time. And then, you know, the most, re the current band, Ikaika, that, that was, you know, 15 years plus years removed from that time in my life and like it's crazy how this obviously how all this shit began um and just to kind of relive those formative years through this you know little project is is super cool what was the uh impetus to head back to hawaii yes so um i just got tired uh well all my family had moved back that were in florida okay, came back okay. To Maui. uh then it was just time um, you know, I had been dating um, my girlfriend then at the time, Cassie, and then uh, I was like, hey, you know, you, you want to go home to Maui? You know, as you can imagine, it wasn't a hard sell. Just got kind of tired of the, the hustle and bustle of mainland life because, you know, when you come, I don't know if have you ever been to Hawaii? No, it's 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 something that it seems so far away, but I have so many homeboys that have been out there, whether through the Navy or, you know, through traveling. I, it's always just something that's like, ah, maybe one day, you know? Well, if you ever want to come out, there's a side note open. I mean, my lady works for the hotels, so she gets okay. awesome. Gigs and whatnot, so, uh, but yeah, it was just like, when you come out here, it's, it's like, it's like a weight gets lifted, you know, off your shoulders. It's just, life is just so much slower here and more kind of family oriented versus the rat race mentality that, you know, you typically find on the mainland. As we yeah. call it, the mainland being the greater yeah. U.S. outside of yeah. <laughs> for those less inclined. Um, yeah, so that's how that's how we ended back up um, out here, um, and then you know started a family and whatnot. But been back out here for about ten years now. And yeah, what was the what was the thing? Did anything change for you? Like when you came back out here, like when you're when you're at home, did or did it still feel like you know the island? um no it's that's the thing like you often hear of people um leaving for a long time coming back and like seeing friends and it's like it's like you never left you just pick right that's up awesome. when you oh yeah that's so awesome. that yeah that was the vibe when i came back and it, it just felt good to be home you know i miss surfing i miss you know seeing all my family and whatnot because i got my you know i have family all throughout the island so you know, it just makes it easier to see everybody who normally I wouldn't see for, you know, at least a couple of years, um, you know, having to fly back and forth or whatnot on vacation. So, yeah. Well, yeah I, I, I was wondering if in this, did you have, did you have any thoughts about, obviously you got the, I couldn't, when I saw the name of the band, I looked it up. The, the, the entire, uh, the definition for the band is, is straight up hard, but I, yeah. I barely can speak american english let alone uh try that name out so i don't want to fuck it up i don't want to fuck it up in the intro but um it means strengths power sturdiness might vigor and determination yes. and that's about a million different fucking awesome things all packed into one word man right yeah you know yeah, yeah. i mean the idea with this project like i wanted to because a there's no greater mention of hawaii you know, within the greater heavy music landscape, 
So it was important to me to choose a name and choose a concept that, you know, is representative of my, of my culture, Hawaiian culture, um, and kind of interject that out through the music and, you know, show people, you know, just the, the, the context of Hawaii and a bit about the culture. And that's one thing that's been very cool to do with this project, because like I said, there's no representation of Hawaii in the greater heavy music landscape. And it's been here. Hardcore has been within Hawaii for decades, as long as it's I'm, been anywhere else. And it, did, yep, didn't they ahead. have didn't they have people jump out from like isn't Honolulu one of the ways they go to one of the other islands? Because I know I was looking around for stuff and I'd see older tour flyers, and it would yep, be like yep. um, Southeast Asia dates, and it'd see like one Honolulu date. So right, I, yep, yep. I, I I figured that was partially how some of these bands were getting out to you guys i guess so it's it's weird because like like bands you went like hope conspiracy i saw a fucking video on youtube they were playing oahu so oahu is where the hardcore scene is okay maui, yeah maui there's no hardcore scene here there's a metal scene there's like a thrash scene um but oahu is is where where that our scene is concentrated there so that's where all the shows roll through I mean, now you're starting to see like uh, Death by Stereo is about to do okay. a, a Hawaii tour and they're going to jump over to Maui, but I'll be, of course, over in Florida for, you know, playing the fest, playing our first show and stuff. So I got to miss that one. But yeah, I mean, there have been so many bands. I mean, Rotting Out has played Oahu twice. Zavalba played 2019. Terror has played. Lionheart, Thick as Blood. A lot of bands, you know, you just don't really hear about it too often. But yeah, I mean, like I said, this this scene has been going on for for decades. Um, and there's actually a page, uh, Hawaii Hardcore. If you search that, on, I looked. Uh, I, I was that's where I was scrolling through. But I also have older like punk tour flyers, and I was seeing the same similar things. Wow. Where, like Honolulu was like a way that you could either come from Southeast Asia, or you could go to from there. And I was like, okay, yeah. that makes sense on how some of these bands were kind of like using it as like an island leapfrogging. Like, hey, we go yeah. to here, then we can get to here. Which yeah, is pretty, it's still pretty cool. Yeah. So where, I, because I have no, I should probably just look at Google a fucking map, but um, Honolulu is its own universe entirely from Maui and where you're at a lot, you know, like, or is that the big city? Is that like the New York? Of, yes. Like it's, yeah. Oahu is metropolitan Hawaii. So then so when, we, when, the, when yeah. shows happen there, does everyone come? Um. I guess it depends. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it depends. Yeah. I mean, there, there's people on neighboring islands, you know, obviously into, into this music and stuff. So I'm, I'm definitely sure. Yeah. I'd be the only the better with travels uh, when they see that, you know, name roll through. But yeah, I mean, the thing is though, it's like, I mean, to get inner Island, it's, it's like fucking, you know, 200 bucks. So you got to fly on a plane and then, you know, find lodging and stuff. So it's not as convenient. Oh, so, fuck. Yeah. That's so that's usually a, a deterrent, like for me to get over there and stuff. <laughs> no, it makes it, you know, like obviously, uh, Philadelphia is on the east end of the Pennsylvania, and then almost 400 miles away is Pittsburgh. And then so you got like a lot in between, a lot in between our main cities and our state, right. but I have no concept until you just said it just how, how different it is in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, when you think about this, when you think about everything that's been going on, you were, I mean, to, to kind of dial back, that's the old proud shit you said when it was awesome. I, um, yeah. when I was talking about it on a live, I forgot the name, but it, it just, it kind of like, you you took me completely off guard because I, I, I was like, by now you think with the internet, we've, we've seen so many bands come from so many different weird countries that have no base for English. And yet, their bands, I mean, especially in the modern times of Whisper and the Southeast Asia kids, yeah. because mm -hmm. more people are torn. It blew my mind that there was like someone active in hardcore in Hawaii. And then, you know, we started talking at the, and, at the, and then not too, so, too long after the Lahaina thing happened. And it was mm -hmm. like, how the fuck is it that as this is all going on, we knew somebody in there. And it was, it was surreal to think that that was something that would even affect the hardcore scene at all. And like right. we're still, I, I still look at stuff every day about it, especially now with Appalachia and Tennessee having water. That, you know, immediately everyone's back to, this is what the government gave Hawaii. This is what, this is what we gave to Israel. This is what we gave to Ukraine. It, like where, where is it? Where is the community at? 
since that we were talking last about all this stuff. Yeah. So <clears throat> as of now, uh, residential where everybody lived is apparently 100% clear. So now people are able to, you know, get the foundations ready for their homes and start rebuilding their lives. Um, commercial, on the other hand, is still being felt out because uh, essentially, so Front Street in Lahaina is where all the restaurants, um, you know, and entertainment was um, in Lahaina. So all those buildings obviously got wiped out. Um, as it stands right now, like per like lot of where those businesses were, there's like wreckage piled up in, you know, in corners and whatnot, but they're, you know, slowly removing. But the crazy thing is, is that the face of life, it's going to look completely entirely different because all those restaurants that were on the waterfront are, were not technically up to code, you know, cause it's in like a tsunami zone. So once we rebuild, you know, it's going to, those businesses are going to be pushed back, you know, blocks and blocks away. So we'll be able to actually enjoy our fucking <laughs> ocean view and whatnot, you know, and kind of set up little kind of local, bring in native, um, native, you know, Know, vegetables and, and like you know um just plants and whatnot like like taro and uh, ulu breadfruit trees just make it kind of more of like a park you know a, a historical park because lahaina is a very super rich hawaiian um cultural city i mean this is where king kamehameha which was our you know the the king that united all, all the hawaiian islands this was his royal capital and at one time it was a lush green you know um west side community um but after thereafter that's when your your sugarcane industry came in your pineapple came in they overtook all those fields you know diverted the water source so they could grow those cash crops and then lahaina just became a barren fucking dry overly dry you know place and then when those industries left they left that land just untethered, untaken care of. You know, when I grew up as a kid on Upper La Luna Road, the sugarcane um, fields were right across our street. They would do controlled burns, you know, every six months or so. And you never had a fire problem because, it, you know, all the foliage and anything that would cause a problem like that would just get burned out when they burned down the sugarcane and harvested it. Huh. But when those, when those industries left, that's what kind of fucked us, you know, essentially as far as, it's just, it's like a tinderbox land just waiting for an event like this to happen. And we got a taste of this happening six years ago when the last hurricane rolled through. There was a big fire right up Upper Lahaina Luna, burned some homes, but they were able to control it. The county knew all this shit that they should be managing, you know, just managing that land a little bit better because, you know, all their power lines the, are. When there's a hurricane, is it the, is a power line or is it something else that's in, 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 uh, starting a fire? Uh, it has to be, I mean, I've seen videos, um, you know, thereafter where, you know, you see down power lines, they're sparking, even though apparently yeah. they shut off the power, you know, but yes. So that's essentially why, how those fires started. Cause we had the hurricane rolling through and then you had, I think it was a lower, a high pressure system sitting above Hawaii, which essentially, and that hurricane was like hundreds of miles away from, from, from us. But yeah. that, that pressure system sucked in all that wind to create this crazy fucking chaotic, like 60, 80 mile per hour gust just randomly switching directions and shit. So once that first, you know, the second spark came up because they put, the, well, so there, yeah, let me backtrack. Um, focusing on that day, there was a fire early in the morning on Upper Lahaina Luna Road, which they had extinguished, and then it caught fire again. And then by that time, that's when the wind was getting super crazy and switching mm. directions. So it just fucking took that. And, you know, you've got, so you got the, so like big sugar cane fields here, all the residential uh, houses across the street. Just a big field going all the way down, you know, towards Lahaina town. And it was, it was just the perfect storm to take that wind. You know, some of it went into the neighborhoods. And then the other half just went down straight towards all the businesses and, you know, also houses and whatnot. So it was, it was just wild. And we had no recollection or we had no idea, especially, I mean, you know, seven miles North where I'm at in Kahana because our power was out, you know, internet was out. Occasionally we get a little signal, but we had no idea that day that 
oh fuck, the fire started back up. Oh shit, the fucking town right now was being incinerated. You know, I could see at like 7 p.m. You know, I walked outside. Uh, we got a big tree line at the end of the property. I could see the big giant fucking glow over the horizon seven miles north. So it was it was crazy. What fucked me, what fucked me up is I just Google. I was I'm on this the Google map looking at all this, and you guys are obviously a state of America. I'm yeah. looking at like for a city grid. It's like just roads, <laughs> man. Just fucked yeah. my world up. But it makes way more sense just how far out you guys are from everything. And then I mean, right. you're you probably don't you guys don't have the same infrastructure as far as an oh. emergency response system, you know, like it, it's just not there. I mean, it yeah, seems like, it seems like also on the one side of an, uh, a one, I mean, cause I'm looking and you can see like uh, West Maui forest reserve, the Ridge trails, you see like all this stuff, like this is really rural. And then yeah. a little bit of that town on that side. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, every literally on the West side of Maui. So out of even leading into Lahaina, Every five minutes you drive, there's a new town. Oh shit! Uh, yeah, De but new yeah, developments or new develop people. There's new developments, tourists, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's um, and, and the crazy thing is, so like everybody would go, all tourists would go into Lahaina for dining and, and whatnot. But like, there's Hanukkah, there's Kahana, there's Napili, there's Kapalua. These are this is where everybody stays, but they all go into Lahaina, and now finally these. Our little pockets of towns north of Lahaina are finally starting to have the the little, um, you know, culture that they should have had, you know, to begin with. You're seeing businesses pop back up that were in Lahaina lost, you know, got burned down, and now they're popping up on our side. Um, so it's pretty cool to see. But for perspective, there's literally one way in, one way out. <laughs> yeah. Um, to my side, like the one way in, it's like a. It's they finally created a bypass, but by and large, it's maybe one, maybe two lanes. So that was shut down, obviously, with Lahaina, you know, going through the fires at that time. But the other way out is around <laughs> Kahakaloa, which is on the backside of West Maui. Basically, it goes from like I see it, I see it. Plus, it goes <laughs> up and around is the only other way yeah. out, right? Yeah, yeah, and then it goes around into Wailuku, but it goes into like a one lane road hugging a mountain. Oh, shit. Where you gotta fucking, you know, honk your horn and shit, make sure, you know, incoming traffic from the other end, because everybody's wow. either going or way back in. So it wasn't, you know, our infrastructure fucking sucks here. It's it's so volatile, and that, you know, the fires just showed how, you know, much of a crisis it is that we have a plan in place when something like this happens. Um, but yeah, so it's just crazy, you know, knowing how volatile we are out here. Um, so yeah, hopefully in your um, in your family's lifetime, this has not been the first time, though, right? Uh, for fires? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. There's there's been fires, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But nothing nothing out of the control. To yeah, I know, like in California, they got fire season, yeah. and I was like. I ain't living anywhere where we're straight up one season a year is fire. Fuck that. Exactly. Fuck all that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how those guys do it, man. <laughs> Dude, but. now it makes so much more sense because I, when I asked you Honolulu, you're like, nah, that's way too far. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it's, there's no, you ain't taking no little ferry over to Honolulu. It's just no, no, there used to be a ferry. There's, uh, there's a ferry from Maui to one other island. It's Lanai, but yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I was look, yeah, I was looking at because it it's Lahana, the Lanai, and I don't I'll embarrass myself if I say any of these other words because I could barely exactly. speak English. <laughs> <laughs> now, like like away from hardcore and away from life, like did you feel at home when you came home? And like, did you like what was that? Was that like the spark to be like, you know what? I'm home. I got the ball rolling. Now let me bring let me bring this hardcore stuff over here and let's start trying to do something. Um, hardcore wasn't even a thought, really. I mean, I mean, aside from you know, I became a bigger fan of the music than I ever was because I don't have a scene out here, you yeah. know. So I was I'm a hungry guy, always looking for new bands and all that shit. But uh, no, I mean the band. I mean, you know, I I had accepted that hey, there's no there's no scene here. So that's when I got you know started to get into like electronic music. Oh and, shit. You know, 
yeah, yeah. So I was, you know, which kind of feel the I mean, it's a whole completely different scene, but you know, um, just a sense of a community of, of music, you know, lovers that are just as diehard as hardcore kids are, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, the impetus to start this project was not even a thought, you know, because I had accepted, hey, that part of my life, those glory days that I love and miss, you know, that's that's just a chapter that was closed because there's no hardcore kids out here that, you know, virtually any that, you know, um, play in bands, obviously. So um, that's when, you know, and my buddy, so I started Ikaiko with uh, one of my best friends in Florida, Josh Couture, who passed away. Um, you know, we have been talking about starting a digital project for a long time, but I was like, you know what, man, uh, I mean, if, if I start something and, you know, step away from a busy life, I gotta, you know, it's gotta be for a burning reason, you know, it's gotta be a lot of intent and a message behind it. And then unbeknownst to me, you know, a month later, the fires happen. I go through one of the worst periods of my life. Um, and I hit him up. I'm like, Josh, all right, now I got some shit to say. Let's do this project. So that's that's how he kind of began, just me and him, um, starting a digital project, and uh, yeah, that's so that's how the band started. Um, and then once we started it, two weeks in, half a song, you know, done. He, that's when he passed away unexpectedly. Um, so then I was like, fuck, so, you know, that just added more mental turmoil, you know, to an already fragile state, having just come from the fires two months prior. Um, I went out to Florida in, last November for his celebration of life. And then that's when uh, the mutual homies were like, yo, whoa, we're going to help you finish this project for Josh. You know, so that's, and then I was, okay, well, cool. We're back on, you know, this, now this project is not just about getting out, you know, everything I was going through. Now it's about honoring a, a best friend. You know, so there's there's a lot of dog in the fight. You know, most people start bands for the sake of fun. You know, I've done my fair share of that back in the day, but you know, this project is personal. You know, not just like I said, you know, dealing with all the bullshit and trying to get all that out and find a positive outlet for it. But now, shit, my best friend, who I finally started a band with, just passed away. <laughs> so you know, how do we how do we make music that a, we're, we're happy with, but B, how do, more importantly, how do we create a body of music that he would be proud of? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's how it all began. Now, I, I uh, again, a little synergy between us. Like, when Punishment was starting, my friend, like, my best friend was still alive, and he had taken his life, like, two, I'm going to say, yeah, seven weeks before our very first show. And so it was shattering to a lot of the people in our in our entire collective, like, friend groups. And we actually ended up writing a song because of it and played it for years. And, it, and it's so surreal, like, a couple, actually, like, two years ago, on the anniversary of his Tim taking his life, his niece reached out and wanted to see videos or, what, like, anything we had of that song or him. And right. it was really weird because, you know, when you're that young, everything that you do with your friends is every day or almost every day. And he was my first roommate. We did a lot together. And when people leave, whether it's just passing or taking their lives, that 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 absence in your life, it takes a long time to fill. And you need things to, t to fill it. You know, like Absolutely. if you're not if you're not positively, actively seeking something so you just don't dwell on it. It's going to eat you alive. Right, and I had to deal, I had to deal with that. So I, I, I mean, it, it, the situations are, are somewhat different, but not a different, not different. I don't understand. Like it, it would, if we would have stopped doing it, then that was the beginning of punishment. Like we would just say, now we're not going to do this. There'd be that gap and the thing in the back of my head, like, why did I stop doing it later on? You know, now that for yeah. us, it's been 25 years since he took his life. Right. You know, it's, it's a thing that, it's a thing that you also need it, but didn't realize you need because you would have been your grief and the things that you need to not move past, but to work on your grief involves like something positive, something to fill that, that void where your, you know, all your thoughts just go right to him, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's important. Like, I mean, this is like this whole demo, this whole band, it's like, it's such a, a surreal thing, you know, because like, it, it's like a pinnacle example of, 
how do you turn tragedy and the most fucked up shit that can happen in your life into, you know, like you said, something positive, something that, you know, transcends not only you and your members and what you created, but it touches people and shows people, hey, man, like do something with that inner turmoil, because if you don't, that shit will fucking eat you alive. It will take your life, you know, if you let it. So it's, it's very important to, to just find an outlet, find something, find a hobby, go for a walk. You know, discover something that gives you peace of mind and, you know, a sense of comfort in our crazy ass world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's a hard one, right? <laughs> you know, like, especially, I mean, this this band you put together, I don't, I'm not even going to get into the graphics because if anyone ever guessed where your band was from, from the cover of the demo, <laughs> they, yeah. they go fuck themselves. Like, you know where the band's from. and now understanding the background from you and what you were uh, you know involved with musically it makes total sense of the directions of this demo mm-hmm. and i think that or i would hope that you pursue and push this thing because there are a lot of younger kids who want a band that sounds like this you know right. <laughs> unfortunately now they gotta either fly your asses out or they're gonna come out to when you start doing these shows out in maui you know right. but there's a lot of people who are younger who yearn for that specific sound that you've now like put out. I mean, we're going to, we're going to have one of the songs on the beginning of this episode for people to listen to that way. You people can fucking hear it, but it, it's, it's, it would actually even be more of a bum out because I can't tell you the amount of kids like, you think they're going to start playing more of this kind of music? And I'm like, I don't know. It depends on who's in the band. And, and I said, yeah. it's going to take, either older guys who used to yep. be in bands at that time or younger kids who are nerds and just, you know, synthesize it and go, oh, okay, we've got the formula now. Let's make it happen. You know, the thing. I mean, you got bands like Balmora, like bringing back yeah. that whole exactly. early 2000s, late nineties metalcore shit. And those are, I think those are younger kids, right? Yeah. 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 So, and yeah, I mean, you know, when I, if I, if I had asked myself, like, when I sent the microphone down, like, hey, if I'm going to start a band again, how do I want to sell it? This is exactly how I'd want to sell it. Just a reminder of the early 2000s years, maybe late 90s, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's just wild. I mean, it's it's a toast to the past, you know, with an eye to the future of the current, you know, hardcore landscape and whatnot. But yeah, yeah, I'm super stoked with how it came out. Um, yeah, if you want to delve into the, the demo cover, so... So that figure you see on it, uh, it's an Ikaiko warrior. So those are the warriors uh, back in the ancient Hawaiian times. Those those are the guys that would go to battle. They'd be wearing the gourd. Um, and yeah, so as a kid growing up, like I'd see um, constantly on t-shirts within Hawaii, like that figure, the Ikaiko warrior uh, with like multicultural slogans. Cause we got Tongans, Samoans, you know, Filipinos, all different types of, um, Pacific Islander and Asian cultures. So you'd see that guy with like, you know, a Tongan slogan or et cetera, et cetera. And as a kid, I was obsessed with those, like collecting them. And, you know, even when you drive around through Hawaii, you'll see on uh rear view mirrors, like the, the, the actual mask itself hanging, you know, from people's front uh, mirrors. Because you know, a lot of people, it's it's kind of a a symbol of uh, we are um, getting rid of spirits or dark energy. So you know, it's it kind of has a superstitious meaning to it too. But yeah, with that cover, you know, I wanted to create something for my culture that fucking people see it and they're like, "What the fuck is that?" You know, like that shit's crazy. Um, how how well versed are you in, like in the Hawaiian culture? Because Obviously, like if you're as old as me, you can go. I remember the Brady Bunch episode where the, you know, but like, and I understand through just the different parts of American history and then before history, I don't think people really grasp not only the depth of their own culture that's so unique, not and it and it it has some elements of like Pan Pacific that has a Polynesian feel to it, but it's also a lot of unique things that are only for Hawaiians. So like everybody who grows up in there it's do they all get taught the mythology and the, and the symbolism like i i really didn't think we would take this quote but like since we're on this topic uh, how 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 quickly could you explain some of like the way that you're enriched 
in your culture so people can understand. It's like, oh, it's not like we're, we're American hardcore is, oh, my band, my my band's from this town that has a sports logo. Here's our fucking sports logo. You know, like right. you're you're talking about seriously deep culturally meaning figures. And I and I love that because of all the other insurance that I have. So I'd like for you to speak on it. I mean, Hawaii is a very war. Hawaiians come from a very war mentality, right? Just kind of like Native Americans. Same, yeah. same shit, just different kind of location. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, Hawaii back in the day at one point had at least a million people. This is like in the early, whatever, 1800s, prior to wow. Western civilization coming in. So we had, you know, we had a system of governance, language, all that stuff. And then, you know, obviously a, a deep understanding of the land um, that's very important to Hawaiian culture, preserving the aina or the land, as we call it. Because, I mean, this is all we got, you know, and, and historically Hawaiians were, you know, I mean, for people to get here and establish Hawaii as Hawaii, you know, all the Pacific Island communities that came over, they had to navigate with the stars and the sun and the moon just to get here. No fucking compasses, you know. So <clears throat> there, there is deeply ingrained in Hawaiian culture is a deep admiration and respect and uh, preservation of the land. Um, when you think of, so in the context of like Hawaii, like being annexed into the U.S. as the 50th state, how that came to happen is fucking crazy too. Same shit, like I said, like, like Native American culture, all these cultures getting displaced. Like essentially, so Hawaii was a kingdom, it was a royal kingdom. Uh, the mm -hmm. last reigning yeah. queen was Queen Leo Kalani. Um, and then basically a lot of Western businessmen grouped together on the mainland, got the backing of, I guess, the military or the Navy, um, showed up to the Queen's Royal you know, Palace on, um, on Oahu and showed up with like, you know, a hundred soldiers in cannons. So oh. That's how essentially Hawaii, she had to, you know, secede. And then, you know, you had Hawaii becoming the 50th state. Um, yeah. So <laughs> it was basically overthrown. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there as far as the treaty that they signed to ratify Hawaii's annexation into the U.S. Like that essentially almost document is kind of null and void because it wasn't filled out properly or you know, what have you. So yeah, there's a, this is why like sometimes when people come to Hawaii, they may get a bad feeling of, from the locals of like, you know, they, they're not wanted here. Yeah. And that's, it's not necessarily the case. The problem is, it's just like, so those kids grew up, if you've never left Hawaii as a local here, this is your rock, you know, this is your territory, you're going to defend it. But you know, a lot of people come to Hawaii thinking it's Disneyland, you know, and it's they can just fucking throw their shit around and, mm. you know, they have no respect for it. So that's why that's why a lot of people in the local community get really pissed off. And you have that sentiment that, you know, Hawaiians hate, you know, tourists. Um, but, you know, the thing is, like, Hawaiian culture is so beautiful. And those you can take the biggest moked out, as we say, like, you know, Polynesian tribal face tattooed, big fucking Samoan or Tongan dude. You can ask him, hey, I want to tell me about your culture, you know, like, and you will see that person melt and you'll become best friends with them because that's what we want people to know about Hawaii. But what we get is, you know, asshole tourists sometimes that kind of ruin it for everybody. But yeah, it's a, it's a very welcoming culture if you take the time to to ask and, you know, allow us to express our culture. Um yeah, so I don't know. That's kind of a little little rundown of. Yeah, the only thing I ever knew about it because I was I'm still obsessed with piracy and pirates, yeah, and during the, during the British Empire, I know Captain Cook was one of the first people to like, like considered like he didn't discover it because you know, it was already there, but like he was one of the the first people from the West that you could do document that had made there made made contact. And then, um, obviously, I have a lot of uncles and grand. And my my great my grandfather was actually stationed in Pearl Harbor because he was a, uh, a one of the Marines. And so, because of Pearl Harbor, is the only thing that I could even think to focus on at a big 
American mainland level that you know about. Oh, well, obviously Pearl Harbor's in, but you wouldn't, you know, we're thinking about, oh, it's just that. You didn't realize how it's 200 something miles away. You're, you're probably 200 miles away from Pearl Harbor. You know, like yeah. it's, it's far, it's way further, but, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's super interesting to me. I, I remember, uh, we have friends in California who moved there or were there because stationed. And it, it seems like people skip the part about like respecting the culture of that era. Cause it's so much further, you know, like so yeah. much further out. It's not just, yeah, it's the 50th state, but I think the annexation of it was done probably before we even thought about, I mean, it was well before world war one, oh. you know, but it was yeah. done, it was done socio-politically so America didn't have something that deep up south of them. It's probably the only reason why they did it. Right. And it's kind of crazy, too, because, you know, after that annexation, when we became the 50th state, it's also what kind of feeds into the sentiment of, you know, a disdain sort of for Western imperialist culture, whatever it may be. Yeah. Is that, you know, hey, OK, cool. Now you're the 50th state. We're going to throw a military base in Oahu. <laughs> And then, oh yeah, you know, one of your other islands called Kahoolawe, we're going to use that as a missile testing site. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, That's that right. Back in the 80s, yeah. Um, when I was, you know, just being born and whatnot. But yeah, it's that island is essentially desolate, just shelled with, you know, tons and tons of pounds of, you know, missiles, <laughs> which they're yeah. trying to, kind of, they've been trying to clean it up for a long time, but it's, you know, how the fuck do you clean up a, <laughs> missiles that may be even you know have fallen and gotten buried and may detonate you know i mean I'll, I'll tell you something completely not off topic but random um we all know spongebob you know spongebob square pants so then you know that the town they're in is bikini bottom yeah. but what's at the top is bikini atoll what's a bikini atoll where there was major um atom and nuclear testing for american bombs for fucking decades. So here's a kid's, here's a very well known kid's cartoon through the zeitgeist. Oh, it's Bikini Bottom, not realizing it. Yeah, and the fucking island was completely bombed by nukes and right. it is still desolate and probably incapable of growing anything. I don't even know if there's a population, <laughs> but it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird kind of like inside joke humor from the writers to be yeah. like Bikini Bottom because they're not going to talk about a, a Bikini Atoll. And, and I think um, the modern people don't pay attention to how much the Americans actually like the idea of them trying to bomb the van, the um, there's a belt in the, that you have to get through to get out to actual space. And we tried to nuke it and we tried to nuke the uh, atmosphere. We were just, we were getting crazy. So yeah, I remember hearing that they actually took away one of the islands. I didn't know the aid, but I actually, you said missiles, and I thought, oh, they probably made it like another bikini atoll, where right. they just bombed it into desolation. Yep, that's that's essentially it. <laughs> Jesus, it's fucked up, man. It's sorry to bu- sorry to bum out anybody listening, but like, <laughs> try to spice it up with the with the bikini bottom part. Um, <laughs> so do we have a game plan here? Are you are you going to try to go back to in the book and say, let me find a church and try to bring some kids to shows? Is there even alternative kind of kids like? I know even in weird parts of America where I've played, I've actually brought this up on the live. We've played in places like Prescott, Arizona, where you're in between two small towns. So we played on um, in front of um, indigenous reservation territory. Okay. Yeah. And you're actually amazed. I was actually like, there's kids are into this. And right. they were fucking stoked that we came. And I never used the word stoked, but the best, like they were fucking stoked to be seeing some band just play on their lands, you know? So I wonder if you started game planning, like how do you do with, how do you deal with this band so you can do anything else? Like how do you, how does it work if you try to do it locally? The, yeah. The thing, so there is, uh, as far as the band, I mean, we got moving parts now. I mean, there, most of the boys are in Florida. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm the only one out here. Um, and our drummer is flying. Who's the brother of our second guitar player is flying in from Chicago to play that hammer and nail fest. Um, it's, yeah, so like the thing is like I want to get through that show first, and then we'll we'll I want to see about bringing the boys out here because we definitely got to play Oahu, and if they're gonna already be out here, definitely got to play you know my home Maui. So there is 
like I said, there's a thrash metal scene here, and it'll kind of blow you away that this is randomly happening in the middle of the Pacific. If you look it up, it's called Volcanic Strikes Fest. It's happening Thursday, Friday, Saturday of this week. There's fucking exhumed on there. There's verbal assault. Um, and a bunch of other uh, bands, you know, a bunch of really obscure black and like punk, grind, death metal. It's a three day fest that they just started throwing last year. And one of which, like, when I went last year, I met the fucking tour guitar player for Integrity. He's playing, I think it's Witch Vomit. Just like, you know, super corpse faded out. Um, right up yeah, here it is. Yeah, we should probably pop the show since it's such a big deal. That's crazy. Yep. Holy shit. <laughs> Those are some names. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, look at it. Volcanic, Volcanic Strike Hawaii 2, October 3rd through 5th. Holy shit. Yeah. The verbal abuse, the accused. Yeah, yeah. Damn, dude, we got to get the fuck over there. <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome. So that's going that's on. Awesome. That's like the first like heavy music fest. Um, yeah. And it's thrown by this uh, pretty good band called Pilau, uh, mm -hmm. thrash metal band over here. Um, but that's like, it's, that's kind of not really exclusive. Like, I'll make a joke sometimes. Um, like I saw the verbal abuse. I'm like, ah, not enough spin kicks, you know, in Instagram comics. They <laughs> just give it a little, like face palm shit. You know, they're not into the more modern kind of variations or adjacency of you know of metal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, there's there's a there's a record shop here that has books. One of the old Wahoo hardcore bands. Um, so there there is places to play. It's just a matter of once I can bring them out here. Yeah, I'll have to figure that all out, but. Wahoo is definitely kind of for our scene, you know, definitely got to do a show there. Um, and then, yeah, just for the sake of, you know, showing all my, all my friends that don't want to travel, <laughs> the band will definitely do a show here. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of in its, in its infancy, you know, because when you have a fest like that, what does that do? That just like kids come out, younger kids, then they start getting into all this shit. And then hopefully they start bands and then we have, you know, some, you know semblance of a of a scene out here but you know as far as like booking bands i mean man i don't know if i can get back into that again that's the why stress, like i got the stress yeah, the no. worry <laughs> <laughs> got enough shit going on but no i mean i got my connects uh high fives and stage dives is a, a concert promoter or booker on oahu so that's where i want to start sending you know bands because i know okay. you know Dutch white yeah Kept a friend. He is he books all those bands. <laughs> so, you know, we got we got him. So, you know, put them all in touch, start having more more um, you know, mainland bands and international bands come over to Hawaii, but Oahu. And then, you know, I don't know, see where it goes from there for here. Um, but yeah. So awesome. I mean, yeah, because that 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 reign of bands that would come over, like I think Zovalvo was 2019. I don't think there has really been a band like that that's come over since. We had a good maybe four or five year stretch of, you know, like I said, all those bands, Terror, Lionheart, Rotting Up, et cetera, et cetera, coming did they over. Still, I, I imagine COVID did the same thing they did there to here, where they were worried about restrictions and all that, or was it less? And I know no, you were in well, Florida. I, no, was no I was, yeah, I was over here. No, okay. I was over here during that. Um, I mean, it was the dark pages over here we were one of, the, one of the last states to lift restrictions yeah i mean i that was so out crazy of work, to me. <laughs> yeah all the way until october that's when i went back to work damn yeah and then it was crazy like to fly in you had to if you weren't vaccinated you had to have a test that had to be cleared by the time you left that mainland airport by the time you got here show your papers if you don't have your papers well you got a mandatory quarantine for two weeks wasn't there some nonsense about Airbnbs in Hawaii or something? Um, it's, yes. So, like, relative to the fires thereafter? No, <laughs> during the COVID, there was people, like, pissed off that people were trying to, like, stay, like, do remote jobs oh. from Hawaii or something like that. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I know. I heard, of... I heard it was, like, a weird talking point on a podcast, maybe a Rogan episode or something, because I know he's had Tulsi Gabbard on before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um. Yeah, I mean, they had to. Even the hotels, I mean, my lady works for the, you know, works at the hotels. She, they had certain wings set aside for 
you know, their tourists that were staying in their hotel, they got COVID. So they had to relocate them in that wing and oh, whatnot. Fuck. Yeah. So it, it got a little crazy for a while here. <laughs> I, th- I, think the, I think the entire world got crazy. I don't know if we ever fully got back to where we were at. Oh, but I, in my head, I was thinking maybe Hawaii was like, yo, we're fucking Hawaii. We ain't getting COVID. But I mean, it, <laughs> well, it, the fact, <laughs> it's a, it, for me, like the problem with modern hardcore is that in America, there's an overabundance. And when I say overabundance, it means that there's more than what, like, if tomorrow I could book every band that asked for shows, we would never not have shows. But if we so many shows, we'd have to make them all free because there's so many fucking bands at this point. And what that leads to is people almost through the internet, well, actually not almost, completely through the internet, there's people that live in a place with a rich history and know nothing about their scene because they're mm-hmm. obsessed about some nuance. Like, we'll just use the Florida, like, I really want my next band to sound like the late 90s Florida scene. It's like, well, you're 18 years old. You live in Massachusetts, which is the center of how many fucking amazing bands and how many, like, there's so much that you can have a band that is like completely sounding like a band from a different area. And we're actually starting to lose in the East coast. I can't speak for the Midwest or anywhere else, but like for the East coast, there was a sound with the Boston bands. There was a sound with some of the New York bands. There was a sound in Connecticut has actually done a good job of keeping that Connecticut sound. The Boston bands, some of them have done a good job, but there's a homogenization that makes things not stale, but it, you can't just go, oh, this is, it's not like, you know, we talk about Ohio. There's always going to be someone, oh, this is integrity sounding, or this is this kind of sounding band. Like there's just, there's so much going on that it's, it's, it's overkill in some regards. And the kids don't have to take the time to learn their own shit. So if, if I say all this to preface, like you could be the band that kind of kicks off kids who may never have heard all this stuff, aren't, uh, aren't obsessed with, uh, the Reddit hardcore chat boards aren't obsessed with Twitter and Instagram. Haven't been to this is hardcore set of fury. And you kind of mold these kids in a manner yeah. of your befitting because you have, I mean, no matter what I, I do believe in, no matter where you're at in earth is some kid who doesn't want to be like everybody else. Right. And I think that hardcore speaks to that. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So I think your shows, wherever you put them on, I think you're going to get people to come and then it'll be kind of interesting because whatever band the first kids see, they're going to want to emulate. <laughs> so, you know, you know, like next thing you know, Hawaiian will ha- Hawaii will be, yo, all these bands that sound like eulogy bands are all out in Hawaii. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, mean, I, awesome. yeah, yeah. I guess it kind of makes sense that the, the sound of this band is like, you know, of that era, the, the 2000s. Um, but, the, <laughs> but the recording and the, the recordings then were much different. Like yes. there's a very there's a modernization of it. So right. in, in lieu of saying like you're a direct descendant of you, I can hear your influence, yeah. but the recording pops at such a heavier volume. The clarity is more there. There isn't that like, you know, like when there's bands that would like sing away from the mic, even right. in a studio. Like there's not that. No, like you got yeah. a you, you got a fucking hard voice. The shit's good. You know, like. Except for if you had a, a different name, no one would go, where the fuck's this man from? What's that word? <laughs> yeah. You know, like it's it's the only it's gonna be the only thing that it, that tells people like, hey, this is what this is. You know? Yeah, yeah that that was a, a a really, you know, good point of again, like I wanted to do something representative of Hawaiian culture, interject that in a scene that doesn't have that, you know, representation. And everything that's like the thing like I want to do, you know, going forward a lot more like, you know, when we continue to write more just interject more of the history of Hawaii in in the lyricism so people get, you know, exactly what we just talked about earlier. But it's in a palatable form, you know, hardcore metal form where they, you know, can digest it. They're like, oh, shit, this shit's hard as fuck. Let me let me let me see what these lyrics are about. And then they learn about my culture. how much I obviously you have you have I had just had the demo up to kind of go through it. Yeah, here it is. You have what we were talking about earlier with the highly strong. 
But what do you, um, yeah. what, what, an endless battle and hammer and nail, like, what do you, do you embed more of your culture into those as well? No, no, no. With those tracks, yeah, the Ohio Strong track is kind of the, the, the standalone example of that, of what I was just saying. Okay. The other two, Hammer and Nail is about Josh. That's, you know, I told him before he passed away, I was like, yo, this song that we're writing is it's our first song as a band. We're going to, you know, it's going to be about me and you's relationship, you know, to some extent. Um, and, you know, of course, that's what it is. Um, and then Endless Battles kind of, the whole trajectory of this demo, it's like track by track. It's it's set up in order, you know, for a reason. Lahaina Strong, without the Lahaina Fires happening, the band would not have started. Second track, Endless Battle, is about my struggles during that time, you know, substance abuse, all that shit, just to try to drown out everything I just went through. And then Hammer and Nail, that's like my way of paying homage to Josh. And then that's what we end on, you know. What was your, um, what was your, what was the saving point for you with those struggles? Did you, did you go to recovery? Like, how did that work out? Like, no, no. I mean, it wasn't that bad. It was just, okay. I just needed, I just needed to say everything. And get yeah. it all and vocalize okay. it, write it down, and then you know, just look at it and be like, "Oh shit, yeah." There's a reminder, stupid. You know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I people don't know this, or maybe they do. I watched a lot of Dog the Bounty Hunter, oh. and I was like amazed by how much, even though it was on the islands, how much like for us in my neighborhood, methamphetamines. Like, it was amazing oh, to see how much. The correlation in you know now because you guys are the 50th state, how much a, a city anywhere in America yep, has yep. these poor areas, these people who are in these constant cycles of bad decision making, drug taking, you know, life threatening decisions that they make every single day, and so like what you were saying, like it's not just Disneyland. It's like, hey man, there's there's parts of Hawaii that are not sweet the fuck at all, you know. Yep. Everything, I tell people, everything beautiful here can and will kill you. <laughs> Whether it's the current, like you can step on, like Westside has like the top rated beaches in the in the whole world, essentially. You step one foot off that shore, that shore break, people don't like understand how strong <laughs> the current is and how many people die on that beach just because they turn their back to the ocean. Oh shit, here's a big sh shore break wave coming, knocks you down, takes you out, <laughs> you know, you know, um, and yeah, all the same problems. <clears throat> a lot of people come out to Hawaii to run away from their shit from the mainland, not realizing that, hey, everything you can find there, you can find here. <laughs> it's just a little more concentrated here, you know? Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting place for sure, but you know, you won't uh, you won't be able to run from your problems very far because we're all here. <laughs> So when you, since you're so far away from the other band members, what are you guys doing for practice? Like, I I, I I know we've had, I've had the practice for the first time we did Shattered Realm, but we did it for the Bob Wilson as a yep. benefit, as an all will suffer. And I remember the first time we had the cell phone, like in, in the band practice. And right. someone like, is it this, is it this chord right here? And you're like, wait, and, and, you know, me being like a boomer, I'm like, wait, you're doing, and they were FaceTiming. <laughs> One guy was FaceTiming, so they have to come. And then, um, so obviously, like you're getting ready for this for this first show, right? Yep. Like, how you guys how, like they're practicing, you're getting ready. So what's gonna happen is <clears throat> my band practice has essentially to get my voice ready and back in condition has just been sitting in my car on my way to work, screaming through the tracks, <laughs> just going back over and over again. The boys. <clears throat> so we had to piece together the band for this show in November. Um, the guitar player that took over from Josh, actually right before Josh passed away, the day before, he sent me a video of the, of the riff we had been working on, tweaked by his friend Marco. That's who would take over from him um, thereafter. So essentially me, Marco, and bass player Kevin, Josh's other right-hand man, his best friend, uh, that's our bass player. So, you know, we just kind of digitally sent ideas back and forth. Hey, you know, I like this, I like that, cool. You know, that's how it was all created. For the show, that's when we had to be like, oh shit, he, we're gonna need, you know, Marco's like, I'm gonna need a second guitar player. Um, we're gonna use, um, we're gonna use Brian from Josh's other band that he would tour in, or Exit Strategy actually, Josh yeah. White and his band, and, or No Friend of Mine as well, their other band. 
Uh, that's uh, so Brian, he's the second guitar player that always tours with them. His brother <clears throat> for the drummer, he's like, Oh shit, my brother, my brother's a badass drummer. You know, like, let me send him the track, see if he'd be down for it. He's in Chicago, so he's learning the tracks now. So, <laughs> you know, he sent us some videos. It's he's about it's it's gonna sound fucking awesome, but the plan is, um. I need to book my tickets here shortly, but um, November, so the fest is November 8th and 9th. I'm going to try to leave the 5th, which will be an overnight flight. I'll get in on 6th. Everybody will be there by then. We're going to practice, you know, run through the tracks a couple hours, and then maybe do it another day prior to the fest, but <clears throat> that's pretty much it, man. <laughs> fly, We're gonna fly, just, by the, yeah, fly by the seat of your pants, there. man. Yeah, everybody's, <clears throat> I mean, granted, our, our guitar player, Marco, has done a great job. Like, he sent, like, here's the guitar riffs, you know, like, bass, you know, like, like playthroughs, so they can see it, you know, see all the all the chords and whatnot, so. And everybody's kind of practicing in their own regards, too. So, you know, we're just yeah, gonna... This is actually, uh, this is actually pretty fucking badass to show your plan, and, um... <laughs> Yeah, Josh Kulcher, um, I can't even say his name, but Josh Kulcher, because he was, um, I got to, I got to play with him. We did a four, four, I think it was like a four day run. Exit strategy, exit strategy played alongside Shattered Realm, and I got to hang out with him. And um, Josh White, a close friend of mine, we work, do we do some stuff together through State of Mind, and um, his guy passed, and so he created Hammer and Nail Fest. And the date that you're playing, it's a celebration of life of our brother Josh Couture. This is at the Crowbar, which is actually a sick venue. I broke my hands on the uh, pole during Death Row's Honor in 2020. $30 a day, $50 for the weekend pass in Ybor City, my favorite place that people watch when I'm at an FYA. And um, yes, just like FYA, just like FYA, you can go to the you can go to the castle. So yep. you have that as well. Uh, Friday night is Haywire, Three Knee Deep, No Friend of Mine, which is Josh's other band. Cold Steel, Right on Time, Migrant Fury. It's not Zero Migrant Chill. Fury anymore. It's uh, oh, no. game. Guy Jin is playing. Oh, it Guy plays. Jin, okay. <clears throat> and then uh, Saturday, which is the November 9th, this is Manball doing Set It Off, celebrating 30 years of Death Before Dishonor, Vietnam, Exit Strategy, Tom and Bond, Plague Spitter, Ika, Ikea, K. How do I say it? Say it. I'm so retarded. Ikaika. E, e. So the I is the E. It's an E yeah. seven. Ikaika. Kaika. Okay, that makes sense. I I I'll barely. That's why. I, no matter how much I try to do a lingo, I'll never be good at any other fucking. I can barely speak English with the Philly mouth. And then uh, Forever Horizon. That's a 5 p.m. start for that one. Dude, this is a fucking great way if you wanted to start something off, man. Yeah. This is the way to do it. Right. And the, the cool thing about the fest is, is that this is like, you know, Kevin, the bass player, who also is, you know, wor working with Josh Lay, and then Tom, you know, Tom, mm -hmm. old, old Tom, but basically oh, my our, man. our yeah. hardcore grandpa over in, in Florida. Yeah, it's my guy. He's helping out uh, with that as well. But, you know, Kevin told me about this. At his celebration of life, the idea for this fest, and the cool thing about it <clears throat> is that this they're going to try to do this annually now, and all the proceeds are going to go to Josh's family because he yeah, left behind right. you know a baby, a daughter, and you know a beautiful wife. Um, so it's it's really cool. You know, it's not just a fest for a fest; it's a fest for a good cause and fucking amazing bands playing it. You know, I I think. I think a lot of times when we do these kind of like things, uh, and I say these things meaning more than just like a show, like I've done benefit shows for people that are past. Unfortunately, we did the one for Howie from Alone in the Crowd. It bought him six more years, but he recently passed. I think that the best thing that we can do as a community, it isn't book a show, get some money and throw the money to save the problem. It's bringing the community together because there's a lot of shared grief and everybody's feeling the loss of that person. And I and I've I've seen this time and time again. I'm an old man at this point with this game of benefit shows or going and playing someone benefit shows. I I can't think of the last time we turned down being asked to play and just say no, we can't. 
unless we didn't have a lineup or we weren't active. And that's been for any of my bands because the importance of this benefit show is to help the family or just help that community with what they're suffering from. And so I, I think it's a great idea, man. And especially at a place that small, that's the, that's a perfect spot for a fucking fest, man. Like you want to see man ball at that stage. You want to be there and see all them bands at that stage. You're going to see dirty, ugly Austin jump in the middle of the floor, all through haywire shirtless as he always is. And that's where you want to celebrate this shit. And I, I actually, um, it was another reason why I was like, excited about talking to you because I know you guys are playing it. I know it's your first show, but it's also like Josh is our guy. We do a lot of work with him, and he said he was doing a fest, and it's fucking awesome that he's doing it. We're playing in Florida like three weeks before, so there's no way that we'll be able to make it out there. Had we not been playing, I might have snuck out there to check you guys out, but uh, I can only take so many weekends away <laughs> at this point right yeah, now. That's true. <laughs> but well, there'll maybe, be more. We'll, br- we'll bring you. We'll- yeah, we'll bring your asses up. I really think that when um, I really think, and it's one of the weird things with this podcast is I just put songs out. Like I don't have I, every once in a while, like the Young Blood guys. Um, actually, um, yeah, a lot of the labels, unless I ask for it, like, hey, can I get that track? They don't have a steady person constantly sending me tracks. Oh, but yeah. the one thing that is current and and often is if it's something no one's ever heard of or they didn't already hear it before. Yo, that's right. And you'll get like, I'll get texts. I'll get, yo, what's up with that band? What's up with that band? So this is actually one of the few times we've had on the episode a full description of this band. Cause you're, you know, like we don't really have it that often where we have, I mean, occasionally like when we did Bayway, we put them on and stuff like that. But a new band that no one knows is on the beginning of this uh, episode. And now we're talking about this band. So if you could get to the part where you're hearing this right now, you better not be texting me going, what's up with this band? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we came, we're coming out of left field on this, on this episode. No, but I, I'm telling you, man, it's awesome. It's, it's awesome. The band rocks and it's coming from a direction where a lot of people, I think, want to try to sound like it, but I don't think they quite got it. Um, are you still doing Still Proud? Is that still happening? Like what's going on in that regard? Still doing so proud. I took a break from it to to give the the, the band its due diligence. Um, but yeah, still proud's coming back. I'm working. I, there's a big sale right now, up to fifty percent off everything I got left. People want to go check that out. Stillproudclothing.com. Um, just enter spring at checkout, and the store is basically half off. Um, yeah. Besides the sale, I got the uh, this year is actually my fifteenth year of of doing the brand. So I do have a a little uh, fifteen year you know, collection coming out probably within about two weeks. And then I'm working on winter stuff too. So get starting to divert like normal the, people's winter or Hawaiian winter. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's never winter here for, yeah. for, 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 for the sake of what you guys are used to, but you know, just, just keeping in line with the greater U S <laughs> yeah. So around uh, probably November, maybe after I get back from the fest, I'll probably drop that stuff, the winter collection at least, but the 15 year release will be out probably within about two weeks. Um, but yeah, start to get 15 back years. Uh, 15 years is an awesome time an awesome amount of time to push something. And I, um, when you started it, it was just to continue on what you were doing. I don't know if you ever thought you would still be doing it at this point. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't think I would. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been, a, it's been a crazy ass journey of fuck ups and, you know, uh, you know, good things, bad things, but it's all been a learning experience, but you know, it's, it's been, it's, it's a passion project, you know, like <clears throat> I, everything I put out is, it's not just like throwing a Supreme logo on a t-shirt. And Dude, it's that's it. the, cool. that hoodie, the hoodie I have from you guys is legit for East them. coast is legit for yeah. East coast. I was like, I was like, Oh, you know, where's that, uh, where's that Hawaiian hoodie at? That thing's thick boy, man. I like quality <laughs> stuff, you know? And I, and like, like what you said about slapping on a sticker, Sometimes you buy from something and you know, like the letters are coming off or the shirt is like thin or the hoodie, but a hoodie, you either want something thick or you want it to feel nice. And I, and a lot of bands are, are, are culpable in this of yeah. just getting the, the cheapest thing to print on. And it's like a brand like yours, man, like the colors pop, yeah. the stuff feels right. Like, like I also have an aversion. Like I, I'm at the point where like I'm wearing Bayway shirt, but, uh, says motherfucker on there. I'm trying not to have, I'm not trying to be a guy who's wearing a motherfucker on my t-shirt right now. 
You know, like I, I, I was the kid in class who had to cover up the finger on the overkill shirt and always had the graphic t-shirts and got kicked out of class. So as an adult, I just want to go to my union meeting and not have someone go, what's up with that shirt? Yeah. And the one time I was rocking one of the still proud things, someone's like, dude, where'd you get that at? What store has that? I'm like, yo, it's some dude out in Hawaii, man. He makes this shit. And that blew him up. Wait, how did you know that? I'm like, hardcore, man. Like, that's how you go. Like, but it's that's something you could wear out that looks cool as hell. And it ain't got no motherfucker on it. So you don't have to worry about making some grandma out mad at you for wearing it. I mean, granted, there there is a fair share of my shit that's got fuck on it and all that. Fair enough. <laughs> wants it in your face but yeah yeah i try to that's like the thing like uh the brand started off as like just putting out kind of like just like slogans or just yeah our logo with a message behind it and whatnot but it's evolved into you know i'm a, obviously a big tattoo collector i love traditional tattoos so taking that like style of art and illustrations and incorporating that with a message you know that's that's where still proud has has gone you know from the early years um to now as far as uh, the type of designs and kind of the, the feel of them. Dude, you know, you just blew my mind with this. One of the most important things about Hawaii culture that I was aware of very early on was Sailor Jerry. Jerry, yep. And, and obviously now it's a rum and a fucking store. And there was, there's these weird waves where no one's getting traditional tattoos or everybody's getting traditional tattoos, but it needs to be said, like he, he didn't put Honolulu on the map, but like, He's world renowned for being yeah. one of the greatest classical tattoo artists in the history of the world, man. Right. And so I, I, I do think that that transferred over to your generation, and that's why you got into it, or were you just like punk and hardcore and like seeing the rancid guys and all their tattoos and being like, I want a tattoo style like that. What do you think it was? It might be a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely coming up. Yeah, I'd certainly see you know just the hula girl, the iconic hula girl. Mm -hmm. Just on the front of your car, you know, a little bobblehead type thing. Um, and that was, you know, his iconic art, essentially. But yeah, probably in the context of maybe when I started getting tattooed, yeah, it was, it was you know, you'd see hardcore kids, you know, getting fucking trad tattoos. <laughs> Not yeah. to the extent of what they are now and how amazing and detailed and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think it was just kind of uh, just something I saw around and, and something that looked cool. Um with a with a little ode to my you know formative years, younger years, and stuff, seeing all that. But, did is that like a museum? <laughs> like, did they have the shop still? Have you ever gone down there? I know, it's, I know, it's I like far away. The, I believe, yeah, the shop I think is still there. Yeah, I think somebody's. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I think there uh, another shop took it over. If Interesting. Not. Yeah, I'm just curious because yeah. we just wanted, I mean, we were talking about tattoos. I'm like. That's right, motherfucker. Sarah Jerry was the Honolulu guy, man. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's like, that's, it's like Maui. I mean, everybody I've gotten tattooed here, of course, leaves. <laughs> Oahu has like the badass, like, if you're looking for like a tattoo in Hawaii, you're looking for some, like traditional, just like pretty much only, you know, like traditional style, Queen Street tattoo is amazing. That's where I got my hands done. Um, yeah, super cool dudes. The, one of the guitar players, Eric Oseto, he's in a band called Third Degree, which is fucking awesome. More of a modern, uh, Hawaii's modern version of a hardcore band. Check them out. <laughs> Third Degree, um, okay. Degree. Oh, yeah, I, I had to mention some band names here. <laughs> uh, Blood Bunny, check them out, too. If people want to dive more into Hawaii hardcore, Blood Bunny's awesome. Kind of more akin to maybe a Kubla Khan-esque sound. Hell yeah, um, okay. There's a band called um, Aswang. A S W A N G, kind of more spastic and chaotic elements of grind into hardcore punk. Uh, they're dope. Um, uh, if I was to, if there was going to be a Lamb of God or a Meshuga from Hawaii, it'd be this band called Nesta. Um, N E S T A. They're they're really cool too because they also are one of the only other ones that kind of like interweave Hawaiian culture into metal. <laughs> okay. So, like like full on like. You know, they speak Hawaiian. There's Hawaiian words and whatnot in there. Uh, we check them out. And then the last two I got to mention, um, they don't have demos out yet, but they're they're working on it. Really cool guys on Oahu. Uh, a band called uh, The Weight of Sin. And then Load the Chamber. Okay. Yeah, those are some bands uh, if people want to, you know, check out, you know, 
other bands from Hawaii, yeah, definitely, definitely check them out. And those, those, they're all on Oahu, I believe. Of course, like I said, you know where the majority of the scene is. <laughs> and um, there's actually a fest at that um, high fives and stage dives um, concert promoters booking um, on Oahu. It's called This Is 808 Fest. If people want to check that out too, um, and that has, I think, all the aforementioned bands that I just mentioned are all playing that. We got like they asked me to play it, but you know I got the I got the fast, so I couldn't. You know the grand scheme of getting them out here, it just wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I, I can't. I, there's gonna be a little bit. There's gonna be a logistics train that no. you're gonna have to figure out to make it work. But I think, I think this flying the flag for Hawaii and like I mean, it, it's an important thing. And I and I'm when we were kids, there was this uh, part of Sweden. I'll say the name wrong, but it was spelled U M E A Umia, and like Abahanada came from there, and the donuts came from there, and there was this weird vegan straight edge group of weirdos, and then now they're back, only they're nineteen year old kids, and they're like, oh, what about donuts? What about all these Swedish vegan bands from the late nineties or the mid nineties? And you're like, don't bring this evil back onto us. <laughs> but there's something about hardcore people when they hear about a foreign area, like. A mystic yep. land like what is this what do they sound like and it's like well if you go to whispers in thailand you're gonna hear the same shit here you know like that mm -hmm. band's actually fucking awesome and you know yep. speed has done a really tremendous job of getting across the country and um obviously like i don't even i i assume australia is somewhere off very very far away from everybody so it blows my mind every time that like there's young kids like dude check it out speed i'm like Dude, I don't even think we. I, I I don't even think I knew any other band that was like in the hardcore punk rock was as Rose Tattoo, so it blew my mind how quick with the internet now bands from so yeah. far are getting popular in the American culture. So hopefully some people oh, can check you guys out. What's that? Yeah, I don't know. I was gonna say yeah. Australia, if you take Australia, man, there's so many good fucking bands out of there. Like yeah, we did Relentless. We did eight, we did Relentless on a fest. And that guy Trent's fucking that guy Trent's fucking ace. I love that guy, and and the Speed people have been the most. You think when a popular band's come around, they're just dickheads. They're the most yeah. accommodating, well mannered, polite humans, and grateful, like truly grateful. And that's like the other part. Like they know that hey, we're so far from home, and everybody is vibing with the band. It's actually awesome because a lot of times, I'm used to the guys like I'm so cool. I'm not going to talk to you. Talk to my tour manager. Yeah. You know, like. Awesome. It's it there is it was a it was a breath of fresh air. Right. So going off of this, we're gonna have this podcast out. We're gonna try to push this stuff. I would hope, because we're talking, you know, I'm hoping sometime 2025, you're hitting me up and going, yo, we're thinking about doing a run. Obviously, Josh Wayne will probably hit me up, already be hitting me up. Yo, you wanna do something with these guys? Or hey, do you guys want to do something? But I would love to see you continue and pursue this. And I think that you got the energy. The band sounds awesome. And, you know, again, if there's bands from Australia killing it here, we get some bands from Hawaii killing it here, you know? For sure. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, there, there's many reasons why I started this band. And, like, with, you know, it's it, one of the pinnacle reasons being to push Hawaii hardcore because, when you know, like, pinnacle example, when you, you know, like, in that live Q&A that you did, we're like, what about Hawaii? You know, and, and nobody. I felt so dumb. Oh no, 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 so dumb botching the name and everything. <laughs> but like, nobody knows. There's not. You can think of a band for every state. Hawaii, you can't. Yeah. So that has always bothered me, um, as well. Uh, but it's not just a problem within you know hardcore here. It's it's all artists within Hawaii. Nobody, few ever think outside to promote themselves or push themselves beyond these shores. And, you know, with this, you know, with this project, this is my outlet and my opportunity to do that on shows like this, you know, where people have, would have otherwise no, I, you know, I have no idea. Yeah, I tried to deep dive. And like I said, it was limited. Um, there were some small mentions. And um, what's interesting is like, you go to like a place like Vietnam, you can go to like Southeast Asia and pan specific band. Like you'll see a lot of people really took some time Especially like the old, like the older punk things, like the uh, Maximum Rock and Roll. It's a lot of people that were really obsessed with Japanese bands. Yeah. So, like, how the fuck do we skip Hawaii? 
It's right there. We got fucking Pearl Harbor right there. Like this is America, Jack. How are we not helping our people out? And I and I was thinking about it, I'm like, there really isn't like even like a, oh this old eighties man from Hawaii. It's like no one was really touring that much in America. How the hell would it, it, it it's it doesn't it doesn't not make sense, but it's important like with the internet and today's technology and the way that our hardcore scene is so logged into this stuff. I want to see you guys get further and represent right. for Hawaii. The culture has always been absolutely incredible. And like it, you could see it. You could see it. I mean, it's it's overlooked and, and overshadowed just because there's so few people that actually take the time to look into it. And even me, like I was like, ah, oh, you know what? We'll, we'll roll the ball here. I hope I don't insult his culture entirely. So I hope <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> Obviously, um, man. <laughs> And I, I, I've done like two other podcasts and, you know, prior to, to recording, they're like, can you, how do you pronounce it? Like, <clears throat> yeah, you can, you can, you first. could have phonetically put it in front of me and I wouldn't have got it. I would have been like, yeah. ah, ah. <laughs> no. even, uh, even with Josh, when we started it, he's like, how do you say that? I had to send him like a little audio recording <laughs> of the name. Um, it's, yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy because. You know, like, and and going back to, to Josh in, in in general, like, there's a lot of people that that I've met along the way, and like, it's always fucked up when those people aren't there no more. You know, what I mean, like, that's like, you know, like we we were talking about doing me and Josh White were talking about doing more shows, like, you know, we did the we did the Florida shows, and then like I remember him giving me the phone call, and then like in this last year we've spoken a lot about it, and actually we're almost a year away from when we just, when we did them shows and there's going to be a hole there forever. But I do think you guys are going to make up in his family by just not letting the memory go away. I think it's important as a hardcore scene to kind of come together. And yeah, I think you would be kicking yourself in the ass two years from now if you didn't do the show. You Mm -hmm. owe, you owe, you owe it to everything that you were talking about. And just seeing it through, you know, like, and I, and I, and I know that you know that, but I, I think that it's an, really important because these, there's a weird bunch of, like, I, I like, if you looked at my wall, there's like flyers I did. And then there's four paintings I haven't finished. And there's a to-do list that's a week old and I only did half of it, you know, like, but like when you're talking about doing something creative with a friend and now you can't anymore. And honestly, like I'm a little emotional about it because for for two years straight, me and Big Frank were going back and forth about trying to get him on the podcast. He's a little bit older. He's a little technologically less advanced. But I didn't pursue it hard enough. And if you would have told me Big Frank would have passed away, like, this quick, it fucked me up. Because, like, that was, like, for all these podcasts that I've done, I've said, I'm going to get Big Frank. I'm going to get Big Frank. I'm going to get Big Frank. And I missed that window. And this is a guy I would send art to, or if I drew something art wise, he would comment on, you know, and he, it's just a very weird thing when you miss that window of opportunity to do something creative and fun with a friend where you have so much synergistically together. We're like, yo, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. You know, like I was, when, when I got told to pass, I was scrolling through text and, and Instagram DMs me him. How many times we didn't get it together because of scheduling. And it just fucking kills me. So, like, I think that you would be sitting here going, I should have did this. I don't know why. I, st- I, I don't know why I let it get in front of me. So, come, come November, you're going to do right by this. And it's going to feel yeah, so man. relieving, man. It is. It's like, uh, it's, you know, it's something I am, have been looking forward to and dreading for a year now. Because looking forward to, because, hey, I'm fucking stoked as fuck to play my first show in 15 years and be a gorilla on stage again. But B... I should be with my best friend, you know? Yeah. So it's a mind fuck, but you know, it's such, and this fest is going to be cool because it's, it's going to be like a big giant family reunion of all the exactly. kids that like my former bandmates in South Florida, all the kids that used to come out to our shows in those areas, they're all coming up and like, you know, now we're all older and stuff. A lot of us got kids and it's just cool to like be doing this shit again. And, you know, for, for a cause and, you know, just uh, just to make some magic <laughs> and uh, relive uh, my formative years and be, you know, I like I feel like a kid in a candy shop with all this stuff. This whole process, like 
granted it's been backwards usually yeah uh, you're sitting in a practice space <laughs> versus the digital world yeah but, like, it's just been it's been super cool and nostalgic to to do this all this project all over again and then you know put the music out now it's different now it's you know like we didn't have spotify and youtube and all this all these social media sites all we have was myspace or pure yeah. volume to upload stuff yeah. to now it's like holy shit you just pay a distributor to send all your tracks to spotify and so like learning you know the new way of how music gets put out and just how easy it is it's a lot easier now <laughs> like you know you don't have to go flyer in your neighborhoods or, or like adjacent cities. Now it's just shit. <laughs> just, you know, post on social media and whatnot and promote it on Reddit and blah, 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 blah. Um, so it's, it's interesting reliving this as a, as an older man now. <laughs> I will tell you that the Bayway headquarters is like two hours from my house. And even during punishment, which we were practicing 35 minutes from my house, I was still screaming in my car, driving home from work, or, oh, this is a new version of this? Okay, let me listen. And, like, I, I was still screaming in my car because it's actually <laughs> it's actually easy to hit. I, I have all my stuff on my on uh, the same SoundCloud account that I have for the podcast. It's on privates. And so, like, when I get new Shattered Realm stuff, I just I just listen to it. Or, like, when we were getting ready for the first part of the show in so many years, the right. same way. So, no matter what happens, you're screaming in a car seems to be the new way uh singers pr perform and practice before a show <laughs> <I guess so. laughs> it's, very yeah, yeah. it's very fucked up man right listen i know you got a lot of shit going on i just wanted to take the time because dude i didn't even know i like i put it all in jess and i'm like jess figure out what the time zone difference is and how we can get this guy on the show and she was like oh it's actually kind of easy i'm like all right cool i don't want to hold you up I appreciate you coming on the show and I really do want to pay respect to the fact that Hawaiian hardcore should be something that is a little bit more aware of for all of us because there's places all over this world that people know about it. And I, I, I am, I am, I was born on fucking 4th of July motherfucker. So I'm, uh, I'm American. <laughs> I love, I love, I love it. And I, and I always fucked me up. And when you're like, wait, Hawaiian, hardcore band yeah why don't i know i should know like like you said you know about you can name one for everybody so hopefully your band puts hawaii and hardcore on the map and i really want to see that i love what you do with um still proud and i love the idea that you're going to be doing this hammer nail fest and i really hope that you push beyond it i don't want to see this just be a one thing because the band's solid man the yep. band's solid people are going to be into it you're going to have the logistic headache from time to time but then mm -hmm. at least the one thing you know is you're not just going to randomly like blow out the gas tank playing too many shows yeah, so just yeah, make yeah. every show you can play important you know uh, there's one more thing too i want to sure. say um, <clears throat> so the demo is actually going to be put out through knives out records in paris awesome toner. awesome yeah, the homie toner who i used to sponsor providence his band way back through still proud you know after the band folded or whatever then he started knives out i've kept in touch with them throughout the years and then you know once the demo is done i was like yo check this out right before we're about to release he's like you want to put this out i'm like Fuck yeah. <laughs> um, so we're gonna do he's he's gonna he's printing up uh we're gonna do um a hundred uh digi die cut clear CDs, nice full detailed booklet. Like if you've ever seen his work, he puts out super, like he hand cuts everything himself and like puts so much attention to the detail of each project he, he puts out. So that's that's cool. Uh we're trying to have those in hand by the fest um in November, but you know, um so hopefully we'll have some for sale there and then I'll put them up, you know, online as well. Cause I'm about to drop some merch for us too. Awesome. Awesome. Probably, yeah. Maybe either Friday or next week. Um, so yeah. But yeah, well, man. The, thank uh, you so much. Uh, all the links for everything you do are going to be up on the episode. We'll make sure they get up when the shit drops. Um, your dedication to hardcore is pretty insane just because of the fact that you went to somewhere else and you still stayed to it. I know people, I know people that are in hardcore for two years, they move an hour away and they're like, I'm done with this shit. <laughs> and you're like, yo, I'm back. 15 years later, I got my next band. Yeah, I'm a several thousand miles away, but we're making this happen. Right. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. No, I mean, this music, it's, I'm a lifer, man. I still feel the same way as I did when I first got into this shit. Just kid in the candy shop type thing. And it's it's not just it's music. It's a lifestyle, you know? Like, yeah, it really is. I found and, it's a, my and it's a community, man. Music. And, you know, I have no plans to, to drop out, as they say.
Awesome. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming on. And um, if there's anything you need me to do, like I said, well, when we were posting a little high of things, anything you need from us, you let us know. Sure. And um, we'll be posting all this this week when the, when the episode comes out, really excited for you guys. And we'll be pushing the fest all through the next couple of weeks, getting ready to lead up to it. Okay. And um, just awesome, man. Thank you for the conversation, Gavin. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the kindness and sending me that stuff. Seriously, this shit's fucking rocks. No, as a kid say, no cap. The merch is awesome. It's so important. And um, just be good. Get your butt to work. And thank you for coming on the show, man. It means a lot. All right. Mahalo, my brother. As we say in Hawaii, ahui ho, or until we meet again. Dude, that's awesome. Thank you so much, man. All right. That was absolutely awesome. Big shout out to Gavin coming out here, talking to us on Hawaiian time. Anyone, please check out Hammer and Now Fest. We'll have the links up. Appreciate you guys all for checking out the episode. And I recorded a little bit extra if you feel like listening to it. I know that one was a little rough to run into, right? I come back after two months talking that ish right away. But it got me heated. You know, we spent a lot of time trying to make shows like this as hardcore. Shows like FYA happen. There's a lot of moving pieces. And so much of the real world is out of our control. In fact, all of it's out of our control. Not some of it. All of it's out of our control. And so, there was never a moment of um, lack of empathy. Never never a moment where there was a, a scale of importance greater than a lot of the bad things going on in this world happening. But my perspective is that we have only so much time And we have only so many resources to do things within our own ability, within our own sphere of influence. For people like me and Bob and Ben Stuckey and all the promoters out there, we're just trying to make really cool shit happen. So when we all get together, it's for fun. I, I am, as of next year, I mean, as of five months, I'll be of booking shows for... 28 years and next year is the 19th year of this is hardcore and I don't live off of this I still gotta get up and go to work when things don't work out I gotta work side jobs and extra money comes in I gotta grind like every single other person I gotta grind through the show things there's bigger entities there was always bigger promoters there was always times where shows that I was hoping to book the venue that we were working with wasn't what the booking agent now with the managers would want. It's a lot that comes into this. And so when a giant international political catastrophe happens, I can understand to some degree saying, well, why would you support blah, blah, blah? But then my question is, why would you assume that we would support this? And why would you you even assume that we have any power to make a difference with the outcome. And that's really the the centerpiece of my anger here. You know, yeah, it was a Jewish community center and it turns out they were doing right from the start because they, they don't, they're not everybody's involved in this the way you would think so. And just in the last couple, in the last couple of years, it's just immediate cut and dry. If you do this, you're a bad person. If you do this, you're a bad person. If you think this, you're a bad person. And yet when the when the crosshairs are over that person who says that about everybody else, now they want the nuances. Now they pull out the apology notes thing on Twitter and they get the jargon out. You got to give everybody a little bit more space to to actively engage in the world. And I would be the first person to say that I think the entire idea that a hardcore show in America can change the outcome of an international I don't I, you could call it like I feel like this is the end of the world for me personally I grew up in the 80s I see this shit like World War 3 happening so I find the idea of a hardcore show being at a venue that's always been supportive for uh, for Bob and the community at large to then be told 
you're supporting this horrendous crime against humanity. It's just fucking flagrantly not true and just in its own right, just nonsense. And and yet do we go to this all the time? You know? And yet in the same course of action, I know people who have made the same complaint and shared these things on the internet who were supposedly from our community who were like, oh, I can't believe they're doing it at this venue, yet they're going to the big concerts. We're the actual owners of the companies who own these giant things that actually are just as corrupt as (laughs) anything else in this world. They're actually giving money to drop bombs on children. They're giving people the money to (laughs) drop bombs on children. But you do not abscond from going to them shows. And you do not go ahead and say, I'm not going to spend my money there because you have to go on Instagram and you got to post your little grunge revival or your little new metal revival. And you got to see the bands when they're coming up getting big. But the big world, the big corporations, is they all have to give money to the goddamn devil. And the devil could be anything at this point. But a lot of what we're doing here is just to get through the goddamn day. This benefit show that is a festival that Josh White's putting on it's going to give physical money into the hands of his family. Our friend Howie from Alone in the Crowd passed in the interim where I wasn't doing this podcast. And we bought him maybe six years as a community. The show was at the First Unitarian Church. We raised enough money to help subsidize the cost of going on to him having this uh, cancer treatment in his brain. He still died, but we did our best. And the outcome was grim from the beginning. And yet the community came together, you know, alone in the ground, came back. Until that time, they only played one show ever. It came back. Terror. Scott Vogel's got the tattoo. He comes and plays for free. This band don't have to play for free, but they did. Support the community. Support one of the people who enriched Scott's life as a young age being a part of the hardcore scene. That's what we do with these shows. We're not trying to book hardcore shows and give the money directly to somebody who's going to drop a bomb on a child's head. And it's absolutely fucking bizarre to think that anybody would want to do that from the hardcore scene. So when this thing went to Bob, it really hurt my it really hurt my whole entire perspective of things because like clearly people are upset, but to take it to the level of trying to completely ripped down what has now become, you know, a clear, the best hardcore uh, festival in the current country. You're going to take this away from this man because he's been doing business for three years through COVID. Through, I, I can't even tell you how nice the people at the JCC were, and it's irrelevant now. That's going to be in the past, but people like me are always going to remember a bunch of bitch-ass motherfuckers who are just flagrantly using the internet to jump on a bandwagon and yet they spe- still spend thousands of dollars at the big companies who actually do sp- spend the money directly. They want the money to go directly to those people who are going to drop bombs on the fucking kids. And, you- and whether you saw it or not, if you went to anything like that, you're the culpable fucking party. Because it isn't hi- hidden knowledge. It's been saying that. People have been knowing that. But when FYA comes to a small little community center, now you bitch, you're a fucking coward. That's all I got to say. T-I-H-C podcast, Philly H-C shows, the Joe Hardcore on Instagram, and lots more episodes. Thank you.